Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's pray, and we'll get started for our study today. So, Father, thank you for this day of reflection on Mother's Day. Thank you for the love you give to us, and, and in and through the lives of each of us have differently been affected by uh, how you have brought us into this world by our parents, by our mother and our father. We know that you make no mistakes. We know that everything you do is for a purpose and for a meaning and for an opportunity to always see and know and experience your love through our mothers and experience your guidance and truth and through our fathers. And so, Father, we ask that uh, you continue to remind us of this reflection of Mother's Day and the, those that are with you now in heaven and those that are here still on this earth and from good relationships or not so good relationships, wonderful times, and all the memories and all the respects and all the different uh, gratitude we have for the fact that you brought us through this passage of life through the womb of a woman that we call mother. That you call our mother and that we are to respect and honor our parents and we thank you so much for these mothers this day. Right? Be with each and every person who has, again, been with you in heaven as we have mothers there now. We think of our sister Lainey with her mom with you now. And others, my uh, mother-in-law, Nancy's, uh, my wife's babes have been been off there into heaven for a while now with you and so we Father, we thank you for each and every one that you have continued to take care of and provide for us the opportunity to again experience your love and your provision and we thank you for all the mothers that are part of the congregation uh, from again from my babes to Pam to Laney to Tracy to Vicki uh, to Sheila and Kelly and Coletta and there's so many people that I and uh, you know Sandy Marilyn Father, there's so many people that have just have mo their mothers out there that they hope their kids today continue to remind them of your love and your understanding of how much appreciative uh, they, they, they are toward what you've done in, in and through their lives. So we thank you for this time of study. We look to now just doing our opportunity to look and reflect on your word and answer questions and in insight into how you would have helped us understand and know what your word says. So be with us now in time of study. Guide us, correct us, encourage us and uh, edify us and correct us where we need to be and just may you be our counselor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, our pastor and all these things in Jesus' issue, his name we pray, amen. So I know it's quite a bit of a Mother's Day. Uh, I think of Sister Laney, it's always the most difficult one uh, when you are going through what you're going through and so our hearts go out to you and, and um, God is with you more and more every day. Yes. And um, Laney, Laney said thank you for all and support during this time. It means so much to me and the family. Yes, and so I, I know that it's, um, I've always said this and I'll continue to say it, it's never something you get over when you lose somebody you love, you just adjust to it as time goes on. There's no way of getting over it. And if people say that, that's not true, well then think about what you, think about Jesus when he died and rose again from the dead. Have you gotten over that yet? I sure haven't. <laughs> so. So, you know, you never really get over things. That when someone means that much to you, you just adjust to it as time goes on. And the memory and, and the things that God has done and continues to do in the memory uh, live on in spirit and in truth. So, uh, I was gonna do Noah's Ark, as we know, and, and I, but we, li we missed Fridays. Uh, we missed Friday, the last two Fridays, and so because of we always do a summer break on Memorial Day and take Fridays off due to the incident of what happened uh, with the car accident uh, with Nancy. We're gonna, can, we're gonna do that early. We're gonna just kinda take Fridays off from here on out um, for the summer early, an early break due to the fact it's more difficult at night when you're going through the recovery process to, to, to go through all the requirements of just the energy level and so forth. I don't want that to be ex extenuating on, on babes. So. so we're gonna do Sundays, of course. So that means that Friday night's q and I didn't want to postpone it too long, so I wanted to do that today. So. Today's gonna be Friday's Q&A. We would have done on Friday, we're doing it on Sunday. Never did Q&A before on a Sunday, but here we go. And then also Noah's Ark issue will be done on the next two Sundays. We'll do that on the next two Sundays about Noah's Ark. Uh, but again, we're not gonna do Fridays for a little bit because of the incident and giving uh, recovery time of what's needed. So <coughs> on the Q&A, we have a couple, a couple questions on that have come through. I don't wanna write them on the board just yet because they're they're lengthy ones, man. I tell you this, uh, Nancy had one that was like all, it was like encompassing, and Vicki had a huge one, and then Pam had a couple of them. And so uh, there, were, there were a few that kept me um, kind of like blah, blah, blah. So I had a lot to do, but, and it was interesting because when I was reviewing over the information to review with you guys on Friday, is when I got the text that, please call me, your wife's been in a car accident. I was like, what? And so that was, that threw me off, obviously, right? And so anyway, um, 
So we're going to go through the couple of questions again. Nancy had a question about Daniel 814, and then Pam had a couple questions, and Vicki had a question that was really large about the blessings, plural, in the book of Revelation. So as time allows and time permits, I don't want to spend overtime on today because of Mother's Day, giving you time and chances to be with your family and do your opportunity to celebrate and, and to remember and reflect on mothers that are again in heaven with our good Lord or the mothers that are here now or anything in between. We want to make sure we give honor and respect to the families to, to do what they need to do today, especially for, for my wife, who's a mom, obviously. So, <clears throat> so with light of all that, we're going to look at uh, a couple of questions. And so the first one is about Daniel 8.14. So if you were to turn to Daniel 8.14, and the question came up from Nancy was about how this is an interesting question here in lieu of the interesting fact that Daniel 8.14, and he says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, but it's actually, it should say evening and morning, but it says days in the King James, but the actual Hebraic, Old Semitic Hebrew, it says evening and morning. There should be sanctuaries, um, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So if you go back up to verse 11, though, this kind of gives you the context. I just read that out of, out of context. But in context, he says, um, yea, he magnified himself. This is Daniel 8, 11. He magnified himself, speaking of the Antichrist, obviously, who's now the beast. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him. The daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given against, against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the earth, and it practiced and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking, one saint speaking to another saint, and he said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? So the question in verse 13 is what the, the key is to understand verse 14. He said, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of the desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, 2,300 evening and mornings. And so Again, that's not 2,300 days. That's actually 2,300 evening and mornings, which is actually 1,150 days, because that equals 2,300. In other words, the sacrifice that Ezra was doing, if, by the way, if you look at Ezra in chapter 3, go to Ezra chapter 3. But it's interesting, but it does speak to something that I did not <laughs> realize on this. So first I thought, okay, because the, the thought was, is the temple uh, built during the tribulation period, or was it already built prior to the tribulation period? And I'm going to show you how it's built prior to, you can see by scripture. But we've got to figure out first, what is this Daniel passage talking about, right? So in Ezra chapter 3, in verses 1 to 3, it says, When the seventh month was come, which is, you know, Tishri doing the high holy day. <laughs> Pardon my Bible just fell out. All right, so he says, The people gathered themselves together as one man. They were in the cities to Jerusalem. Then stood up uh, Jeshua, the son of Jezadik, and his brethren and priests, and Zerubbabel, and the son of Shetiel, and his brethren, and built a, a sacrifice altar of the God of Israel. And they burnt offerings thereon, as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar up upon its bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings there unto the Lord, even burnt offerings for morning and evening. That's Ezra 3.3. 3. And it goes on and, and talks about they kept also the feast celebration of tabernacles, as it is written. And then you go over also, and you go down, and, it's, and it even tells you later on, and afterwards, verse 5, offered the continual burnt offerings, both of new moons and of set fe feasts of the Lord, and they were consecrated, and everyone willingly offered a freewill offering. Now, what's interesting is they did this prior to the temple being built, right, as you pointed out. And then you go down even to uh, other passages here, when you'll, you'll find that Zerubbabel in verse 8, and the second year of their coming unto the house of, the God of, God of, uh, of house of God at Jerusalem, the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zedadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests, the Levites, and all that were coming into captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from the sons of 20 years and upward to set forth the work of the house of the Lord. So it was, it was there that he built his, the foundation, because it even speaks to this even later when they were crying and leaping, weeping and that. Then he goes into talking about how when the temple itself was built, which is much later, so I'm going to go back to Daniel 8.14. And so the question was that, you know, this is about, this is actually about, this is about the, the second half of tribulation. Instead of me trying to tell you all this, I think it's best if I draw a graph out so you can see what's going on. So if I draw this graph out, I'm going to use my own 
chart that I did in my own paper here. So you got 1,260 days in the first half of tribulation. And then with that is you got the white horse. He comes on the scene, remember? <clears throat> and he's, he's going through there. And he's actually, um, let me see here, is that right? Yeah. So he's for 450 days. And then the red horse, he's doing his deal for 780 days. And you can know this by the aspect of what later on I'm going to get to. So and then there's a then oops, then part there's a 30 day window in here. So I want you to see so this is also a 1260 60 days here. This is actually 1230 here. And then there's 30 in here. There's 30 actually 1230. I'm trying to get that right. There's 30 days right here. And what Daniel's talking about is this is when this is when the beast comes out. And this is the beast who is, of course, the black horse. But then there's also another 110 days here. So I just subtract that from here, actually. So that's 1150 days here. There's 110 days here. Whoop. Hence, there's 150, see? That's right here. Because there's 110 days here. And this is where the beast, oh, the mark of the beast, is instituted. So all the economic government is instituted right here. And then you have the pale horse right here. He takes over, which is when he has the abomination of desolation is here. No, it's actually at the be at the beginning. So the abomination of desolation takes place at the beginning. The abomination of desolation begins here. Yes. So which is actually this is actually the this is actually the midpoint. Which is the like you said right here is the midpoint. That's the midpoint right here. So then the first 110 days abomination of desolation is established. But it's not until here then he declares himself he declares himself God. And he sits in the temple. That's when this happens. Okay? So the abomination of desolation happens 110 days prior, and 110 days later, then the pale horse, he sits here. And that's what Daniel's talking about, is that he says, when ow, he says, when is the daily sacrifice? And the and he asked the question, um, when, how long shall it be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? And the transgression of desolation give both the whole be trampled underfoot. And that's 1150 days. So the daily sacrifice is stopped here because there's sacrifice being given here up until he says, I'm God. And I sit in this. So when he says that, they, it's over. There's no more. But the beast is taking up. They're, they're doing sacrifice here, all the way through here. They're doing sacrifice, is what he's talking about. Now, Revelation. Here, Revelation in chapter 11 gives us a clue about the temple being there. I'm just looking at this. This is a really complicated question. So if I get kind of off trail, rabbit trail, I, I will bring it back. Trust me. It just, no, yeah, you did. It's like huge. It's a lot of stuff. You, yeah, yeah, it's a lot. I, don't like, I mean, your, yours could be like the whole entire day today. But So if I go to Revelation chapter 11, for example, I want you to go to Revelation 11. This, will, this, pr this proves to you that the temple has to be built already before the tribulation begins. And let me, let me tell you how you know that. Revelation 11, he says, and a reed was given to me like a rod. But you know what, the question you got though, I wanna, again, thank you, because it reminded me how, you know, why do I believe that again? I can't remember, I couldn't remember why myself. I actually forgot. And I go, gosh, why is that again? And then I, I had to go back and say, oh, that's right. There's a scripture right here. And so. Anyway, I, you, when there's so many, when you brought up a scripture that was already had some pregnant meaning in it, that took me off guard. And I was like, wait a minute, what does that mean? And that made me go, wait a minute, why do I think? And I, I want to make sure, I didn't care if it was wrong or not, I just want to make sure I got it right, you know? And so I went back to Revelation and said, I wanted to prove that it, I wanted to prove that it wasn't built before tribulation, to, to your point, right? That's what you were asking, that's what um, uh, uh, 
Arthur Fink was saying. So I'm like, okay. So, so I go, and I, I like him. So I go into um, verse 1 of chapter 11, and I read this, and I go, boy, this is, you can't get around this. He says, and a reed was given me like a rod, saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. But that court which is outside the temple cast out and do not measure it because it was given to the nations and the holy city shall, shall, they shall tread 42 months. Now, what you have to understand here is, is interesting, because here, this piece here, this is the trodden down by the Gentiles. This is, this is the, this, these days here, this day here, all these days. Yeah, the entire, this is the first half of trip, the first half of tribulation. But then you have the second half, which is here, is, is here, but you have here and here, and this is called a different kind of trodden down. Here he says, and Daniel, he gives you a clue to it, trod, he says trodden down. Now this says by the Gentiles. But this, and that's because Antichrist is overseeing things and it's not nice. So trodden down here is, is the, is the um, holies and the sanctuary and, and the, the host. So this is in the second half. And you see why the holies is trodden down here because he sits in the temple. That, that's why. But this half is not, trod, is not trodden down holy sanctuaries because he's not sitting in the temple. It doesn't say that. It says that only when the abomination is established and then later on he sits in there. That's what happens. So when you go through all this, it's rather an interesting. Um, so here, remember, the white horse, he's the man of sin. When he's the red horse, he's the son of destruction. And when he's the black horse, he's not a good dude at all. Obviously, he's the lawless one. And this is going to go back to answer Sister Pam's question. And she says, hey, why is there, what's the significance prophetically of numbers when it clearly says in numbers, uh, I wrote it down, sheesh, uh, numbers chapter, uh, was it, 9 verses 10 and 11, about how there's two Passovers. There's the Passover normally. But if you travel a long distance on, on a faraway journey, or if you touch a dead body, then you have to do Passover 30 days later. So she goes, what's the prophetic, prophetic significance of that? Not even knowing your question, it actually ties in. The, <laughs> the significance of that is there's no coincidence there's 30 days in here. Where do I get the 30 days from? Well, that's easy because from right here all the way this way, if I count the 30 days of the first half, which is the, which is the last it's the last days of, of first half, right? The first half of trib. If I count those plus the 1260 days, which is the second half, right? Then that's going to equal 1290. Last time I checked my math, right? So this is spoken about in Daniel. In chapter 11, if you read in Daniel, for example, go to it. I'm, I'm going back and forth. Hold on a second. So in Daniel 11, because it's kind of exciting stuff, so I'm going back and forth. Or in da Daniel 12, if pardon me, not 11. My bad. It's 12 verse 11. <laughs> Here's, no, here's why. Yeah, yeah, why, yeah, yeah. That could be right. But here's the thing that this speaks to prophetically is because he's right here when he does when he's the lawless one. What's he doing? His main objective is that he goes after. He goes after the Jews. So that onslaught of them being run over to Petra is a 30-day ordeal. Their trek out of Jerusalem, their trek out of through the lands of Ammon and Moab and Edom. That whole trek is a 30-day window. So the beast is given 30 days to go and go and kill them. And he's going to kill a ton of them. But 144,000, 12,000 from these 12 tribes will make it safely into Petra. However, think about this. If he's going to be killing his, these Jewish people and they're traveling as families and brothers and sisters and, and faith of covenant people and they're traveling to, down to Petra, again, to give you scale, 
It isn't like they're going to travel alone. It's like that's not going to happen. They're traveling in groups. So when they're traveling in groups, they're going to travel. Hey, you go right there. Boom. They're going to go right out of Jerusalem. They're going to go this way to Ammon and Moab and then Edom. Right there, it says it. Ammon, Edom, right down to Petra. This is about. This is going to be a while. So for 30 days, this this trek is going on, and the Antichrist is coming after him hard and heavy. This is where 30 days of Passover comes in because it's a prelude to that and the besieging of Jerusalem. I'll give you that, but prophetically it speaks to the fact that there's no coincidence that Daniel brings up 30 days because in Daniel 12:11 he says, "And from the time the daily sacrifice should be taken away, and the abomination makes desolate, there should be 1,290 days." No, so. Their trek starts on, yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. So, so he could, how, by the way, how do I know that? Remember this, to your point. How do I know that? Because the midpoint happens in February. How do I know that? Because the two witnesses are killed and they exchange gifts to mock Purim, which is in February. Right? February, March, which is February, March is Adar. And the song's the next month. The next, the next month, 30 day, for 30 days, they should have been doing their Passover. Now they can't. Because they don't, they can't do it. They're they're trying to <laughs> survive, and they're they're running to Petra. In the meantime, not only are they going on a long journey, but they're also touching dead bodies. You cannot tell me that mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and relatives are not being slayed right in front of them, and they're probably lamenting the death of their brothers and sisters who are not going to make the journey because the Antichrist does what he does, or they just can't. They do whatever, but they're going to be some death. They're going to experience, and they're going to be probably lamenting and shortly just oh my gosh, and they're going to on their way. It's going to be a horrific scene. So it's going to be a long journey, and they're going to be encountering death and be grateful. The 144 that do survive are going to be tremendously excited and grateful, but yet now, sad and mourning those who didn't. What about, there would be Jews people living outside of Jerusalem at this time, wouldn't they? Sure. So they're just automatically, how did you get them? Because they're going to die somehow. Well, that's what I mean. He, so the, only 144,000 live, so he's going to kill. Yeah, I know, but what about the Jewish people? Out, how is he going to go after them if he's in Israel? Oh, well, well the, whole th the, the idea is that, you know, he's going to be, the majority of them in that area are going to be in that area. The majority of Jewish people are going to be gathered in the area. But there are going to be Jewish people here, for example, other countries, absolutely. But by the midpoint time, we see this now, but by midpoint, they're going to have a majority of them right there because that's their whole center of life. And they're going to be gathered, to your point, coming in for the Passover. So that's how, th think about this. There won't be Jews unless they're totally disobedient. And all Jews at this time will be obedient because their temple is going to be built. Remember, the temple's built. Passover is coming up. They make their journey to go to Jerusalem. So on Adar, he kills Moses and Elijah. But then, you know, he gets killed as well. But then he rises up from Antichrist with the beast. They're going in thinking they've eliminated the, this is, they're going to do Passover. And now he's coming after them. Well, it's easy for him to get easy pickings because they're already there. They've all been gathered for the Passover. And that makes tons of sense now because all the Jews would have to be there. You have to go to Passover. You can't just not go. You have to go. So they're all there. So no matter if you lived in Asia or South America that's or North America, is he correct? Yeah. They're all they're all irrelevant to where they live at the time. They've all congregated there for what reason? For Passover, because it's a month after Adar, and, it, and it's people living here in the states or whatever would be going to Jerusalem. Correct. Now. Correct. So they're all going to be there, and then he's going to then rise up from the dead and come after him. They're thinking that he's. That, he, that he's the guy, because Moses and Elijah are taken out. They think those are false witnesses. Those are actually the true witnesses. And then you are going to have this. He's going to portray. He's going to go just, you know, pursue them. And that's what Daniel's talking about. Yes, babe. Um, Lainey previously had said, "What did Nancy say?" She's asking about about the Jewish people living in Jerusalem and, and how do they get there in reference to are, are they all, all? We're not saying they all live there. We're saying that whether they lived in different continents is irrelevant to the fact that during this time it's Passover, so they've all come to Passover, because that's, why wouldn't they? The temple's been rebuilt, it's been functioning for three years, this is their normal process. You'd be excited as all get out to finally have a Passover over the last, this is your third year doing this, you'd be ecstatic, which by the way, was the third year, was the last year that Christ did his, remember? Remember that? He only had three Passovers, and the third one it was over. So interesting enough, they're going to go for what they think is their third Passover, and God's going to go, you don't get to have your third Passover. You only get to have two. And after that, you're done. Well, in the temple, that is. And then they're going to be done. And so, wow. 
And so he's, he's going to come after it for 30 days. And the reason why the prophetic fulfillment of Pam's question is going to happen because 30 days later, they're going to get in Petra. This kind of gives you the image of what's happening in Petra. They're going to, you imagine, you make it there. You're, you're remembering the horrific journey that was made when our pregnant Jesus said in those days. Pray it not be winter, Jesus said in those days, which is February, March. It's right at the, it's still winter time, going into spring. And then, I guess when they started their trek, they can't now, it's before Passover, they're making the trek. And now they're like, oh, great, you know. So it's right, it's like they're, they're there in the city prior to Passover, preparing for Passover. And so remember, Palm Sunday was the week prior to the Sabbath for Passover. Don't forget that, right? So he's there. They're there gathering a week ahead of time to be in the city. So it's still going to be mi early March uh, to, to April when they're get gathering there. So he says, pray not be in winter, pray not be pregnant, and pray not be a little child in those days. And so they're lamenting all those things that they heard, all the things they just experienced, the loss of life, the long trek, the hatred from this Antichrist who's now the beast, what they saw in Moses and Elijah being killed, now realizing that was not a good thing, that was a bad thing. And then they're probably realizing, oh no. So the first thing they're doing in Petra is, they're reflecting on now a new exodus. They just got, they just got an exodus from not Egypt, but from Jerusalem. Ironically, they went from Egypt to Jerusalem, then they went from, Egypt, they went from Jerusalem to Petra. And they're gonna, they're gonna be here having a Passover reflecting on this exodus in Petra. That's the first thing they're gonna do, is have Passover in Petra. Why? Because they have to somehow obey God's rules and God's law, and they go, oh, that's right. God gave us a 30-day stay of execution, if you will. He gave us 30 days additional. If we're on a long journey, we just came from a long journey. That's a long journey. <laughs> and, and also, we just got finished touching dead bodies as well. So we are legitimately in the line with real numbers here in chapter nine to do this. Yes? He's killed at the right around Adar in February. I mean, they wise the twelve hundred thirty days, twelve hundred sixty days. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So he, so he's right in here. So Antichrist is killed right in here. Uh, in the twelve hundred thirty. Right at the end of twelve hundred thirty days, he's killed. Yes, he's killed right at the end of that. So the beast shows his ugly face at the last thirty days of the first half. And this is what Daniel's talking about when Daniel says. When Daniel says, from the time the daily sacrifice has been taken away, because the who takes it away is the beast. The beast takes away daily sacrifice, not the lawless one. I mean, excuse me, as the lawless one. Not the, not the man of sin, not son of destruction. The lawless one takes away daily sacrifice. He takes it away. And when he does that, his first action is going toward the Jews. His next action is setting up the abomination of desolation. And then he becomes the, then he becomes the pale horse, you know, <laughs> It becomes the opponent. This is what this is called. Then it becomes the opponent. Now the 1335 days. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that too. I'm going to show you that too. Yes, babe, sorry. Vicky said, where is 45 days that fill out the number of days seen in That's what you just asked. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You're both on the same page. Nancy asked the same question. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that. So I know I'm kind of going over this kind of excitedly wise, but so just kind of put it aside. So the beast, the beast, um, so uh, right at, at Purim time, which is about February 14th, that's when Purim is, February 14th and 15th, that's Purim. And he's going to, at this point, so the beast at Purim, because that's when he comes into existence at this point, he, it's right here. So he's going to come into Purim, and he's going to then pursue all Jews who were gathered, who were gathered in Jerusalem for Passover, which is the next month, which is, which is, you got February, March. This is February. Four, well, I should say Adar. It's Adar. Which is oh. February, March. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at uh, yeah, I know. So you look at Adar is Feb is mid February to mid March, which means if Purim is m is the, is in the middle of Adar, that means in our calendar that's at the end of February. And ask anybody living in Illinois what it's like to be in end of February. Is it snowing there? Yes. Is it cold? Yes. So that's why Jesus said, "Pray your flight not not be in winter." Check that box, right? So now you know why he's saying that. So 
And, and, and that means the next month, which is Nisan, so the next month, which is Nisan, and the 14th, that's when you have Passover, right? Well, they can't do that now because they can't prepare for Passover as far as their lambs being brought to the city. They, no, they, you can't be, they're running. They're running for their lives. He's coming after them. They can't, they cannot honor this Passover. So they go the next month. They go to. That's the question. See, this is, this is where, this is where I believe personally that they must have brought some lambs with them, with their, what they traversed with some, some unleavened bread and they traversed with, with some animals. They had to, or God had it already in Petra there, which I find that hard to believe. It's a desert area. How would he have a lamb sitting? I mean, they, it's a desert region. So they probably just took a lamb. They probably realized what was happening. And they said, you know what? We're going to believe, like Abraham did with Isaac. The lad and I are going to go up to Mount Moriah. And when we return, he had faith that God was going to just raise him up from the dead, I guess, because he said he's going to sacrifice his son. So I think that's the same. I don't know. So either, either they're traveling with a, with a young, because remember, it's a year old lamb, according to scripture. So it's not, you know, huge, but it is still a lamb. It's still big. You can put it on your shoulders. So you could do that. Um, that's one option you could have had, or God just provides it because he did provide a ram in the thickets for Abraham out of nowhere. So he could provide yeah, maybe so some. I think they put a small child yeah. there so he could turn into a lamb. Oh, and I think yeah. would you make a chart out of this and just put it in our boat? I'm going to have to. Yeah, I'm going to have to. <laughs> it's too much. So, so they either, either they bring a lamb with them over their shoulders, uh, which you can say that typifies when Abraham brought up Isaac, or you could say that God, like Abraham and Isaac's story, had a ram caught in the thickets. He could have a, a, a herd of sheep you know, caught by the side, which they go, interesting. We've got to obey Passover. That's not a coincidence. These lambs are right over here. Let's bring those into the city with us. I don't know which one it is, but you know one thing, that ER, which is 30 days later, this is 30 days later. This is the Passover that you're allowed to have. This is your second Passover for those who traveled a long distance. Or t What's that? I don't see how they'll have multiple sacrifices. They, they won't. They won't. They won't. They're just gonna. I think they're just gonna have a Passover. They're just gonna kill him, and they're gonna they're gonna like cook out the the blood and everything, and have a, just have a a, like a a semblance of Passover. That's what I think is gonna happen. Because by the way, again, the scripture for that uh, is in Numbers chapter nine. This is the Numbers nine, uh, ten and eleven. That's your second Passover they're having. So, so this whole thing is taking, this right here is taking 30 days. That whole thing takes 30 days. So he's getting, he's coming, so he goes from here, he's he, till, till Passover, like, uh, uh, well now at Passover they arrive, they, but they, they arrive in Petra around Passover proper, but they can't do Passover because it just came from a long journey and they touched dead bodies, which you know they did because you had, what they had went through was horrific. You can't. Come on, that, that's, it's like you're not going to have your loved ones be killed and not you know, hold on to them or try to help them. You're going to be touching a dead body. You're just from the nature of the attrition of it all. It doesn't say that, but you kind of, in, I mean, come on. So you realize this is happening. Either way, you got them covered by the Numbers 9 passage. Long distance alone qualifies them to have to wait 30 days, if not the dead body part. Either way, they qualify. Yes? Elaine, you said it's similar to the night. Yes, that's right. He said, do it quickly. He said, roast it quickly. That's right. He did say that. And there was no altar in the Exodus, to, to your point. There was just a quick, to your, that's a good point. I forgot about that. You're right. There you go. So it was, it, was not a tip, it was not a typifying of the temple Passover. It was typifying of the first Passover when they had their Exodus from Egypt. This is an Exodus from Jerusalem to Petra. And then boom. So great, great point, Lanny. That's a great point. So now, so you see Daniel's 1290 days is counting the last 30 days of, of the first half plus the 1260 of the second half equals 1290. And that's why Daniel says in chapter 12, verse 11, he said that from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination, because he does that, the, the daily sacrifice is taken away here, and then the abomination is here. So he's just he's counting from the first point of when the beast comes on the scene. So Daniel's counting when the beast comes on the scene, that's when all hell breaks loose, which it is. That's when it gets really ugly. And that's why he's counting the and last. At the end of the 1230, because the Antichrist is killed and the beast comes in. Correct. Now he says, another, he says, 
And he says, but he says, blessed in verse uh, 12 of chapter 12, blessed is he that waits and comes to the, to the 300, the 1,335 days, which is 1335. Now that, what he's doing there, is now he is counting from right here. He's counting from when the abomination is set up all the way out, because that counts 1260 days. So that's the full, that's the full second half. Right? Plus, he's counting 75 days. And what's that for? Well, that's the 75 days right here where the Lord comes down and he throws down. That's Armageddon. That's not good at all. Armageddon is when you have Gog and Magog. You have number two battle there. That's not fun. And then you have Jehoshaphat. So that's happening in the last 75, that last 75 days. By the way, the chart that I did on the prophetic calendar. Well, is that 75 days incorporated in the whole 25, 20? No, no, this is, this is after tribulation has fully been completed. So after you have 25. 25, 20 plus 75. Correct. So Daniel 13, 35, he's talking about, is, he's talking about the full trip Full tribulation plus plus the seventy-five days. The Lord uh, makes the Lord's judgment. The Lord's judgment of Armageddon. It's insane. All right. So, another, another, yeah, in other words, 70, the first 75 days of day seven are spent with him doing that. It's like his, his in other words, his millennial reign begins when he, he comes on the scene as a judge. He comes on the scene with the heavy hammer, with the sword, and he treads the wine press. It's just, oh my gosh, it's horrific. So, his announcement as the, as the millennial reign begins, as he's the Messiah, it's made demonstratively. So it always comes back to the sense of, I, I always think, like, you know, what's the one time in his ministry, the three, or the four main highlights of his ministry are his birth, his, his Palm Sunday, his crucifixion, and his resurrection, right? Those are his four highlights of his whole entire life up to this point that we know about our Lord God Almighty, God the Son. His birth was a private ceremony, if you will. Only a few were there, shepherds, animals, Mary and Joseph, that's it, right? So you're like, that, that's it? And some angels were proclaiming, you know, goodwill and peace toward men. So. But yet, his, his, his Palm Sunday was by far the biggest event by witnesses. Crucifixion, not many witnessed that. As far as in the followers, they all were scared out of their minds. And the resurrection, not many saw that as we know. So, and then later on, they saw his resurrected body, but at first, not many saw the day of the resurrection. So the Palm Sunday is by far his biggest witnessing event. That's not coincidence, because what did they witness? A pre-coronation ceremony. To what? To him being king of kings and lord of lords. To what? To him one day walking into the restored temple that he will raise up. Not the one built in tribulation. He's going to destroy that thing. And he will raise up his own like. And you imagine this 75 day period. I contend to you. He's not using the whole 75 days to do Jehoshaphat and to do Gog and Magog. Within this 75 days, I, I have come to understand. Because of this 30 days here understanding that the beast chases down the Jewish people, 30, 30 is God's earmark for maturity. So, but there could be a 45 day of judgment, but whatever this, whatever how this is broken down, I don't know yet, but I'm saying within this period of time, within this timeline, there's a period of calm. And the reason, there's a period of calm because you can't go, you cannot go from, from total judgment and annihilation of all these people from Gog and Magog and also Jehoshaphat and then go right in to the coronation of the king. You, that's too much, man. That, that is, there's, that's the, there's, the, there's a calm. There has to be a calming. Well, how do you know that? Well, because before Jesus came in to Palm Sunday, what happened? He had the embalming, didn't he? Yes, he did. He had the moment where they, where they, where the, he, he said, he said, not me, he said, that what this woman did would be spoken about forever. She wouldn't be forgotten. 
because she embalmed him and she did to him an act of, of worthy service. And so this woman, who I think is the same one who grew in spiritual stature, again, is a prelude to prior to Palm Sunday. He was already prepar preparatory going into this, right? And so I believe that you have a preparatory sense of there was a calming. There was a, a sense of, of sweet just embrace, of just embracing who God is. Aroma was still in the room with the alabaster box, right? And so here, after this judgment happens, I don't know how much time, but there's, I believe there's a time frame here where God has a calm before the storm, and then, and then all of a sudden he just, I mean, I can imagine how he's going to do this. He might just go like this, you know. I can't imagine. It, and all of a sudden this temple just out of the ground, or out of nowhere, just, just, just erects itself. And then all of a sudden the angels start all of, and the trumpets and the harps are just everywhere in the heavenlies. And they start hearing, and I'm like, we're all like, oh, wow. And those on the heavens or in the earth are all hearing these melodious, glorious praising of him as he takes, as he then goes through the eastern gate. And as he does go on, the, he does go to the eastern gate and he proclaims himself as the king and he sits on the throne of his father David. He yells up, like, wow, what a moment that would be, right? So with that being said, that 1335 days, that Daniel, he says, blessed is he who gets to the end of that. He says of that in verse 12 of chapter 12, blessed is he that waiteth and comes to the end. Okay? So who comes to the end? Because again, to live through this, What's he talking about? So in Daniel 12, in Daniel 12, 12, the blessed person, well, the blessed persons he's talking about are, are, are who? Think about it. Who's the blessed persons? You know who they are. Their, their blessed persons are, number one, the 144,000 Jews who survived in Petra. That's one group. The other ones are the remnant people, survivors of the trib. You know how, how, how really, they're going to see hell on earth. They've just seen over three-fourths of the world's population annihilated. How do you think they're going to feel? And then they got finished seeing this? And Daniel's going, yeah, blessed are you. If you live through all of that, boy, you are blessed. Meaning, the word means happy. Well, yeah, because you know you could have been, should have been dead. The odds of you living are immensely against you, and yet you were spared. That's amazing. That's amazingly crazy. So he found out the blessed persons are the 144,000 Jews and the remnant survivors. And, of course, we have the 144,000 Sun Medicor. We definitely have those guys. So those are your three groups of people that are in Daniel 12, 12. Those are the blessed ones who see the whole thing. He said, blessed are you. Well, yeah. The 144,000 Jews and two Medicoi, obvious reasons why they're blessed. And the others that survived, they know they could have been dead. Do you wonder the, the ones in Petra will feel guilty that they survived and guilty that they're not out trying to help somebody because they know there's more tribulation coming on them? Well, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. You're asking if people in Petra will feel like a guilt and remorse over the fact that they could be out there helping out their fellow brothers who are getting probably, you know, not probably, they're getting killed. So I... I mean, I would think that they might feel that. I would imagine so. But at the same time, they're going to be sealed in Petra. They're sealed in there. Yeah. And, and, and the argument that I would have with myself is, at what point do they come? I, when they're in Petra, the, the fact that the scripture says that they ask Jesus, Yeshua, where did you get these wounds in your hands and feet? And he says, in the house of my friends, is evidence that they, don't, they still don't understand who he is. So the fact that he has to, they have to ask that question and the fact that he's telling them in one day they're, they're brought to salvation means in Petra, they can reflect all they want on the emotional piece of it. They did not come to terms with who Yeshua was during Petra's time there, which is rather sad because you would think with all the emotional trauma they went through and the spiritual and mental duress they went through, what better scenario could you be brought to than to maybe kind of, maybe could there have been some Nicodemuses and Joseph Arimathea type people within that group that say, you know what guys, um, this may be because we got the Messiah thing wrong. We, obviously, we, we got that. We know he wasn't the guy. So what if he already came? So it's almost as if they said, we got it wrong, but maybe he's not yet to come. That must have been their conversation. They couldn't have been talking about Yeshua was the guy. because if they, or, or if they did talk about that, no one believed it. Because they all were, it says, in all, all of them in one day were converted, so they didn't believe it. So it's really a sad, and that I'm, I'm bringing that up because your question about the emotional state of their remembrance of their brothers of going, gosh, 
I should be able to do something. I feel guilty. I'm not doing anything. I think all that emotional, mental, spiritual work that they're going through is really, it's really condemning and it's really convicting to them to go, my goodness gracious. It's almost like God purposely handcuffs them to, to let them know that's your just consequence, that you can't do anything. And you have to now lull in your own sense of what I've made it unable for you to do because I've locked you away here. He's locked them away. He protected them. But the negative reality for them is they can't, they can't help even if they wanted to. And what if they realize, hey, where's my uncle, cousin, nephew, brother, son, daughter, wife, husband? Too bad. If they're not here, they're not here. Yikes. They have to live with that, to your point. And then they have to live with the fact that for three years, three and a half years, they're not even thinking about Yeshua being the Messiah. Or if they were, they didn't even care. And for those out it's amazing. in the world that are suffering, they, they may as well be hibernating for all the Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, they're not doing it. So I think the, the emotional, mental, spiritual, you know, traumatic, imagine, I mean, going through that situation, having no relief, having no sense of calm and peace and comfort is, you have a provision of being safe. That's about all you got. But you don't have the emotional, mental, spiritual, you know, comfort of God at that time. And that, that, that hurts. I mean, I can't imagine going through a hard time, losing a loved one. They're going through that, right, Sister Elaine? going through a traumatic event, babes in the car accident. Now imagine going through that and you have no one to comfort you in the way of the spiritual strength and, 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 and resource of God himself. Without People can comfort you all they want, but God himself is not there. It doesn't mean the same thing. You gotta have God himself being the one who comforts and gives you peace and gives you love and gives you assurance. And without having that for three and a half years, I couldn't imagine what that does to you. And Petra is not, I'm sure it's one of your show, it is not habitable. It's for man your peace. I went through yeah. the spruce group. Oh, I knew that was different. Yeah. It's not habitable. See, I, I might, they must be very depressed. My point, they must be very depressed coming out of, of, of Petra when Jesus finally, when Yeshua finally appears. No wonder they're going, they're probably so despondent, so out of touch with anything that matters. They're just going, where did, where'd you get those wounds in your head to feet, you know? That's an interesting thing. Interesting. interesting. Well, the thing is, they're forced that way for safe haven. I think it's not, I don't think it's a matter of knowing to go there. I think they're forced there. To your point, I think it's more of a forced issue of their pursuit from the beast to them forces them in that direction. And they're forced to that. Like, for example, they didn't know to go to the Red Sea either, did they? Nope. But God forced them there only to see his miracle of his provision take place. Just like I think they were forced into this region of desert and then God made the miracle of, oh, well, look at that. We, 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 can, we can go right there and then God closes it in and they're like, okay. Correct. The flood in Arnon, yep, the Arnon River right there, he floods that, and they, yeah, they got to go that way. So it's similar to when they crossed the Red Sea, not like Sisyphe DeMille's movie where it goes like this. It, it, it parted as they walked. So they never saw the other side. They didn't know how long it was to traverse. They didn't know. They could see arguably before they went in, but once you're in, it's above your head. You can't see. You don't see. You don't know how long, how much more steps do I go before I reach the other side. So I think the same goes with this trek to Petra. This exodus is mirroring that exodus, they didn't know other than go south. Go to the land, because he doesn't have re or dominion over these lands. And he's forcing us down south. We're going to go down south. He's trying to flush us out. Meanwhile, God's using his pursuit of them to drive them to a place where he wants them to be safe, those who survive. And so they end up seeing Petra, just like they end up seeing the Red Sea part and go, let's just go there. And they keep on going step by step until finally they reach the other side, they reach Petra, and then God, they go in there, and then God seals it in. That's what, I don't think they knew at all, to your point. So they didn't know nothing. At the end of the 2,520 days, there are only 144,000 in covenant, not in Petra, excuse me. Correct. And then again, it's just uh, in covenant, there are only 144,000 people Le alive. That's it. That's sad. Well, like, That's well, sad. Well, That's right. That's all that's left. It's a lot that died, a lot. So three quarters of the world's population, and more than that of the Jewish people, are all dead, except for those people. It's just so sad. Uh, no. So you're either. So you're either. So your question was: Well, there is there. There's up covenant Jews, and there's in testament Jews. There's only. At the end of tribulation. That's all that, yeah, the only people of covenant is going to be these people. Everybody else is going to be in testament. These are, these are believers in Christ that from their testimony, they just, they, just, they just didn't get beheaded yet. They didn't, they didn't get beheaded or take the mark of the beast. He was pursuing them to kill them, 
and before they got killed, Jesus came. And that's why he's saying, Gee, Daniel's going, count yourself lucky. Because if he didn't come, you'd have been dead. You, you know that, right? That, that's, that's why he's saying, even for the elect's sake, I cut the, so if he didn't come, if I didn't, go, if I didn't come, if I didn't cut the day short, if he, if he gave the, the, the beast, I should say, the opponent, if I gave the opponent more days, it's a matter of time. He, he would have killed you. It's just a, it's just a attrition thing. The world's so big, and he's, he's going to be hunting you down. Eventually, he'd have got you. But I came. You should be fortunate that you're still alive. And they're like, good God. You mean tell me? So they're going to they're gonna know. It wasn't because of their militia, you know, foothold in some, fort in some fortress somewhere, or their stockade of canned goods and water. That's how they survived it out. They're going to they're gonna know. Uh, no. They're going to know that that's not true. The only reason they're alive is because Jesus came. And they, they're going to know darn well that if he didn't come, they'd have been done. So I can only imagine maybe the walls are being almost about to be burst down, the last bastion left of these people going, oh no. And here come all these demons. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the <laughs> Lord comes. He's like, um, we would have been dead. <laughs> we, we know that. So I think that's, there's, there's gonna be, there must be a demonstrative event that's happening to them to make them just feel like in shock, knowing they could have, should have, would have been dead. And God spared them. Why? And, and they're gonna be like, wow. So it's a good bad. They were spared from not dying under the hands of demonic presence, Satan himself. However, now they got to go into millennial reign with bodies of flesh, blood, bone, and sin. That sucks. So you know what's worse? You know it, they've been better off, you know, having their self be beheaded because they get to be an heir that way. But they didn't get a chance to do that. Well, now surely they'll be subject to the most high. Even though they're in covenant, yep. they're going to be subject to the most. I mean, in testament, in testament. They're going to be subject to the mosaic law. Yep. The rod of iron. Yep, but all that. Have, they didn't have a heavenly a he inheritance either. The Lord no, either. no. Oh, my Lord. No, no. So the ones that no. get no heavenly inheritance. No, none. The, for the 144,000 or the others? The 144,000 Jews, uh, there's some of them that can ascend to the heavenlies. And of so course, the, these two groups, but this, the remnant ones, no. None of them will ever, that's off limits. The remnant people who survive tribulation will never see heaven. It's not going to happen. Like, never. They'll be on earth experiencing like a heavenly experience here because it'll be made perfect by Christ, but they won't go to heaven itself. So I hope that that answers a lot of the questions that you were asking. So then I also want to put to the side over here just to give you some point. It's really so sad that we're trying to find a way to get into heaven in the millennium. I mean, none of their, none of the people that sired them will be having a heavenly inheritance, nor them themselves. I know. I know. I know, I know what you're saying. They if they're Methuselahs or Adams, they lived more than 900 years in the millennium. And there probably will be some of them like that, some unborn in the first century and some who still live in at the end. Wow. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of movement going on. I mean, so look at all those centuries and bodies of sin and death, Moses Law, Rod of Iron, no heavenly inheritance, and blow it at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I know it does suck, doesn't it? It, do it does. <laughs> It does. <laughs> wow. So there's and a possibility of and, and, and by the way, and by the way, look, so Ezra finished, he does the sacrifice, starts it in Tishri, which is the beginning of the High Holy Days. Zerubbabel finishes the foundation in Iyar, which is the month of the second Passover allowance. Interesting. In other words, God finishes calling out the number of Jews. That's going to be the foundation from which he'll build Israel out of those people on the earth. It's like, yikes. Isn't that crazy? Think about that. He's going to use the fa he's gonna use 144,000 to then pro propagate out of them the people that will make up and comprise Israel in the days of his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, those who would make the play. And, and that's when Ezra, I mean, Zerubbabel coincidentally built the foundation. He finished in a yard, which is interesting to me. And then you have... No, not at first. At the end of day seven, they have a chance for that. At the end of day seven, they have a chance for heavenly inheritance as they get to be a part of the wife of God. Is that what you're talking about? Did you? So of these 144,000 Jews here, 
for a whole thousand years if they pr those who produce the fruit yields prerequisite to go to the heavens will then go up to the heavens and be second. They won't be a part of the bride. Uh, I shouldn't say inherit. So that's a good point you're at. They will enter the heavens, put it that way. So they will, they will be in the heavenlies, they will enter the heavenlies in day eight, but then the distinguishment between those who inherit and those who enter will be, they'll no longer be, because it's not gonna be God the Father, God the Son anymore from day nine on. It's the throne of God and the Lamb. So therefore the bride and those who are beneath her, the wife, those th that's a clear di di distinction in day eight. But once day nine happens, there's no longer a distinction. God's all in all. So there's no more God the Father, God the Son, hence there's no more bride and wife. It's all, it's all just all one now. But so how that looks, I don't know. But to your point about will they inherit? Technically, no, not in day eight, but they'll be there as enterers into the heavens, second to the bride who's the inheritor, who's the heir. But then they will also be, they're like the maidens to the bride in that sense. But, but they will, in day nine forward, you, you can call it inheritance, I guess you can say that. So day nine forward, they will inherit, and so will the obvi obviously anybody else who's up there. But they will not have that during the thousand year reign of Christ, seven years. During the whole seven, day seven, the thousand years, their whole purpose is to produce the fruit yield. So you have a chance to be a part of the wife of God. And then for the next thousand years, then they get to enter potentially those who get, those who did not produce the fruit, enter day eight on the outer darkness because God spares them, but yet they get on the outside. They're on the outside of the city. So that's the difference. Does that make sense? You with me, kind of? Yeah, so I thought you said earlier that they joined in 11 didn't have a shot at, uh, at having the inheritance. I'm talking about these guys, the remnant ones. These people. Uh, Sorry. I, so I asked why they didn't the have the Correct. Correct. Because under 4,000 do have a chance. They don't have no chance. They're the, they're the Darnell. These are the Darnell people. These okay. are well, these I are the say one, a remnant uh, marries a, a, one of the 144,000 and they have children. What are their children? Okay, that's, well, they're going to be weeded out. The scripture says at the end of the day seven, the harvest comes. Angels, they're going to try to marry into these. They're going to weed them out. And when they weed them out, then they don't, they got put in fire. They don't hear it. They're done. But, but their children will have some Jewish blood. It doesn't matter because of the fact that he said, so this goes back to Pam's question she asked long ago about what constitutes a Jewish person. Well, those who are the inheritors in this context are 144,000 from 12,000 from each 12 tribes. So God's already made it clear to us, however the DNA got there, he's telling you those are Jews to him. These people here who try to marry into the Jewish people and hence have half a half Jewish bloodline are not greeted so kindly because he calls them tares or darnell. And he tells you clearly they're gonna be weeded out and cast into a fire out of his kingdom. So they're not constituted as Jews. They're more like, you know, they're, they're half, they're half free. I think it goes back to not just the bloodline, but the intention of how they were, how they were actually, uh, how you wanna say, impregnated. It wasn't like a, it was more like through coercion, more like through rape or something like that. It wasn't like through an agreement type of thing. It wasn't consensual, if you will. So these, that's not a pleasant thing to th because think about. Because in that day, they, those 144,000 are not going to want to marry outside of the No. Because it's, uh, that's why scripture in Matthew 13, it says the tares are sown while men slept. The enemy man, so he, so, the, so Satan is influencing a man to do this action. So it wasn't of their own accord. They're doing this being, they're being puppeteered, marionetted by Satan, who's then, he's, he's sanctioning this operation. So, because he's not, he's been chained in the abyss. So he's actually not happy about the situation. So his influence is being used to proliferate the, the thoughts of these people who are sinners to go after these people. So, because they're being used by evil influences, it's not their own intent, it's Satan using them to do what they think, take the kingdom by force. Like he used the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. It's similar to how I mentioned on the Easter message, how they thought they were using Judas to get to Jesus, Yeshua. Little did they realize Satan was possessing Judas when they were talking to him. So Satan was using them, and they never saw that. And they still don't see that, just like here. They, they, they're gonna think in their own minds, they're gonna go after these, these Jewish people, but it's not, that, but behind it all, God's telling you in Matthew 13, the tares and the wheat parable, is that it's Satan who's behind all this, the enemy. He's possessing a man to then influence, not possessing, he's influencing a man to, to do these actions, to bring about his bidding. His bidding is to destroy from them. He, he missed out on killing them, right? He had a few that left, and the few that got left still got a chance to get to the heavenlies. He wants to again take from them their inheritance. He can't take ours, Our, we're done. Those who are on the earth have their inheritance, those in the heavens he can't touch. 
but he kind of can with the influence, which is why some leave their, his whole thing is to take from people who don't have the inheritance yet to make sure they don't have it. So he comes after the 144,000 through the influence of these guys, and he comes after those in the heavenlies, as we know, who enter those foolish versions by their presumptuousness and by them not preparing themselves to have been ready to go for that thousand years of their responsibility during the Irish time. And that's how they fall from grace, God forbid. I don't, that's insane even to think that, that angels who fell out of heaven were a precursor to those of us who would likewise presume upon God and don't be prepared when he wants us to do things and just act out of, uh, he says in Jew, which they say, as you say it, left their first estate. Who would do that? Someone asked me this week about it. Why would an angel do that? And I said, it, obviously they wouldn't do it on their own accord, would they? It had to be something that they're, they were, they're, they're influenced by, right? Just like the angels were influenced by Satan physically in heaven when he was the, when he was the anointed cherub that covereth, how they influenced in day seven. But by his, not by him personally, but by his influence of the sin that they interact with on the earth when they're going to and fro, they see, they're influenced by what they see. And they're not ready, they're not prepared and the resources aren't there to draw from to be successful in that, in that situation. So over here, so I'm gonna put over here the temple. So how did I put this here? So the temple's rebuilt. And that's an Adar. And that's Ezra. Oh. Ah. Up. So the temple was rebuilt in, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 15, and that was done in Adar. And then in 445, as we know, the, the walls of the city were rebuilt. And that's Nehemiah. And that's in Elul. So this is month seven. This is month two. This is month 12. And this is month six. So it gives you an idea of some of the timeline here of what's going on during this whole reference to Daniel, this is what's happening around the events leading up to this prophecy, but just kind of gives you some ideas. So I'm not sure if that it helps to answer your question, but so in going back to the tribu tri Revelation, so when he says how the temple was built before, I was saying how it was built beforehand, because Revelation 11 said that they shall tread the holy city for 42 months, which is, hap which is basically, 1260 days, 30 times that many months. And I will endow my two witnesses, in verse three, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And that's, that's right here. So they can't prophesy 1,260 days with, within a temple if the temple's not built now, can they? Do you see? Well, he, before he says measure the temple, he says, he said the, the context was him measuring the temple and then he brings up the two witnesses. So in verse one and two of chapter 11 of tribulation, he says, measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. But that court, which is outside the temple, cast out and do not measure it because it was given to the nations in the holy city that shall tread 42 months. So you see what I'm saying? 42 months is the same as 1260 days. Yeah, and the, the witnesses start day one of tribulation. They're okay. Correct. The witnesses start day one of tribulation, correct. So but the two witnesses the start, the two witnesses are right here. The two witnesses and the temp and uh, so so that they're 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 in the outer court of the temple what he's talking about so they're right there so they're right there they're right there on temple grounds. Okay, they, so that would be Yom Kippur when the, the two witnesses would go out. Day one of the period. Yeah, basically around that time frame or Yosh Rosh Hashanah. It's basically in Tishri. They're starting, this is, is in Tishri, they're gonna be doing this. And then they're killed in Adar, which is a good three and a half years in. All right, so this is how you know, so the temple had to be built for them to be 1260 days doing this, right? It, it tells you right there. So that you have to, 
because he's measuring the temple during that period. You saw that? So you can't say it was built during, no, no, it had to be already existing because it says they were, he says, no, that's being trodden down. Well then, wait a minute, trodden down the temple is a fulfillment of, that. then it had to be already there. So that means, to your point though earlier, that means before this time period, hello, well Ezra sacrificed here a good, it was a good, you know, you got some time in here, this is 59, 559 BC, you got a good, there's a year in there, or about seven months in there, month seven, you got eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, you got seven months in there before you got, you have the foundation of the, of the, of the temple being laid. The temple wasn't built until 40 years later, 42 years later, but there was a seven month gap between sacrifice and the foundation being laid. There's really no correlation here of the exact nature of how long beforehand, but to your point, Sister Nancy, there's going to be sacrifice. Sacrifice is made prior to, to the temple being built. Now, the sacrifices being made prior to the temple being built, I believe personally, will be of such a, a, a situation where they will be, uh, I think they will happen like in the similitude of this seven month period potentially. So could it be, to what we're talking about before, could it be on Rosh Hashanah, they began doing this, because in their minds, we talked about this earlier before we got started on the live session, but the Gentile calendar is January, December. The Jewish calendar, calendar, not what they call the new year, but their calendar, starts in Nisan, which is March, April, and goes through February, March, which is Adar. So it's Nisan to Adar. So, okay, so if the calendar for the Jews and Gentiles is what we just said, January, December for a Gentile, and it goes Nisan to Adar for a Jew, well then why do they call the Jewish New Year Rosh Hashanah and Tishri? Because that's when they have their new year of their, their sins being passed forward from that year to the next year. So to them, that's a cleansing of their sins that's a kind of a big deal. So for them, their new year of being forgiven and cleansed is what they guard a year by. It's just like your birthday. You say, it's my, it's, it's a, this is a new year for, for you, it's a new year. But it's not the new year of the calendar. We talked about that before. But I, I personally don't see it being out of line with maybe this year or some year. There's going to be coming up soon. So if we know, if the projection is 2023, roughly, we'll... That would mean in 2022, or 2021, or 2020. So the next four years, we're gonna have some kind of sacrifice at the altar taking place prior to the, sh the temple being rebuilt. So could it be, coincidentally, there's seven months. So you, you, you said before, Daniel 8, 14. Remember the whole passage conversation and question you asked me was, is the temple being, re is the temple being built during tribulation and it takes seven months to erect and then Here's what I think the issue is. It's not about during tribulation what's happening, it's about prior tribulation what's happening. So the temple is being constructed, which takes seven months, but once it's officially being constructed, they start sacrifice. That's what's like, wow. So that's what's happening here. So once the temple's, it, it's, it's being sacrificed, I think it's gonna take seven months. I think that what they're doing here in type of Ezra, the type of Ezra is it took seven months between his sacrifice and the foundation being laid. I, there was a delay in that time, but I think this is speaking to seven months prior to tribulation, the temple will be declared where we're building it. And as soon as they declare that, the Dome of the Rock's been gone, they declare they're building the temple, and as soon as they declare they're gonna build it, because the ground, the, founda the, the foundation's been, been laid to do that, there's gonna be a seven months of sacrifice. That's what I think is gonna happen. Seven months sacrifice in the Old Testament in the historical mindset, those seven months sacrifice, then the foundation was built. I think it's gonna be the reverse. Foundation will be laid, and then they'll do seven months of sacrifice until the temple's all built. That's what's gonna happen. He's doing the reverse. So the foundation's gonna be laid, and then they're gonna say, okay, let's sacrifice, because we know now it's a matter of time before we have our temple up and running. So there's gonna be seven months prior to. That's what I think Ezra's type's about, to your point. Great insight on that, because I didn't even see that. So it's about the sacrifice beforehand happening prior to tribulation happening, which is again an, a, a huge red flag God's given to the major thought of churchianity of how did you guys get this wrong? But you see, they're not gonna, they're still, 
I, I don't know how they don't understand it. They're going to still probably think, why are we still here? Why are we still here? Yeah, you know? When, <laughs> you know? People, when the dome detonates, how long do you think it'll be from the dome detonating to them having to do the, uh, the sacrifice? Foundation? Yeah, oh, the, the, foundation, the foundation, yeah. So I, that's the part I don't see. That's interesting right there. So that's the part I don't, that's, I thought about that. That's the part I don't know about. Will the dome decimate from an earthquake or from some other act of ignorance of their wars over there? Either way, how long would it take between when it's decimated to start laying the foundation? Correct, correct. So the interesting part is is that is that they're gonna. It, there's there's been before, like I mentioned before, there's been times in Israel where there's been peace, and so there could be. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, in November of of 16, when Trump won the election, and that year when he won, I don't know if you know this. Uh, but I looked it up, you can Google this yourself. The Zionist people in Israel asked Trump, and then they asked Putin to rebuild their temple. What? I didn't know that. I was like, that's crazy. There's like record of them asking that question, like petitioning, please, please, please. Because they knew he was pro-Israel. And they knew that Putin would, I don't know what they asked Putin for, it's kind of crazy, but he's not pro-Israel. But, but they were asking Trump to do that, then they asked Putin as well. And they both kind of hem and hawed about it. That's what the record said. But it, would that be what's happening? Will it not be the Antichrist, but more of this political stuff that happens that allows for them to say, let's, let's just appease, let's just build a foundation. Nothing's going to be built yet, just a foundation, you know. And they build a temple. We're not going to say, you can both share it, you know. Because they, want to they, they like the fact that they can. The Dome of the Rock issue is the sacred ground. They don't have to have a dome itself. It's about just having a sacrifice where they think Muhammad went up and all that kind of stuff. He sacrificed Ishmael there, they think. Abraham did. I think Muhammad ascended from there, they think. So if that's the case, well then, let them have their time in the temple as well. So they're not going to be adverse to a temple, per se. They're adverse to the fact that they don't want Jews walking on their land that they think is holy. It's not, and they, don't want, they want to have a sacredness of that land. So can there be construction going on, hence the reason for sacrifice, outside of the city, outside of the temple grounds, they're sacrificing until the temple's built. Hence the reason why you need Antichrist to come on the scene, because now when the temple's built, the Jews have been sacrificing for seven months. They want to right now go inside the temple and do it. And now there's now there's a fight. And now they're going, no. They, they because no one was off, no one was doing anything on temple grounds. They were just constructing it. Debating when it's done, then we'll deliberate who's going to have what. And that's why the Antichrist comes on the scene. He becomes the peacemaker and he solves the biggest problem of all time. You know, so I think that's going to be what looks like what might, might be happening. So I hope this answers your question, Sister Nancy. You tell me, does it answer your question about the Daniel 8, 14? This was all because of that. So, <laughs> so and then Pam's question was answered about this. So does this answer your question about that? 1,230 days? The 2,300 two the two thousand three hundred evening mornings is actually 1,150 days. So all of this kind of falls in, but I hope that answers your question. Does that answer your question? Kind of. You're thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah I just, um, it's a lot. Yeah. So, and then prior, yeah, prior the Dome of the Rock prior to this yeah. is destroyed prior to that. Yeah. Well, it, it was it, well, you just said the point earlier about how much time between Dome of the Rock being decimated and the foundation being, how much time between. What's interesting is, does Dome of the Rock get decimated trigger in the Jewish mindset their excitement that therefore they know they've already dedicated an altar, right? So now the Dome's decimated when that happens. Will they then immediately go to that conclusion? Hey, I want to do sacrifice. I want to do, because they, will they be excited about now the next thing to do is to lay a foundation. But until that's negotiated, let's do sacrifice. Let's do that. Or, and then they start, nah, let's not do that. So maybe that conversation happens right after that happens. How long that takes, I don't know. But then they start, and then, then they, lay, they start laying the foundation, and then they go, hmm. Then they start doing the sacrifice. I don't know how it's going to work, but I think those are the things we're looking for is the Dome of the Rock being destroyed, and then after that, you're going to have sacrifice being made, uh, so they have the foundation being laid, and the construction is going to be started. And then during that construction being started, they're going to go, well, let's just sacrifice now as a preparatory sense, just like our forefather Ezra did. Let's do this in our preparatory sense of gratitude to God. It's back. Like he did there, same thing. He did it as a preparatory sense that it, it, it was expected is going to be built. They're going to do the same thing. So 
that's what it brings out to me, which I did not see before, which means there's a seven month lead in of huge awareness and preparation he's giving to those in churchianity to wake up. But they won't. They won't see that. Yeah, it's interesting how the Babylonians got treated as a separate type. Oh, it really is. And they don't even see it. And, and that goes, so this answers one of Pam's questions as well. But now I'm going to go, to, since, since we're on the topic of a little bit of tribulation, revelation, I'm going to skip over Pam's question for now. She had a couple questions. I'm going to go right to Vicki's questions because they kind of tie in. So even though, uh, and Sheila had a question too. Gosh, I forgot about Sheila's. Um, I'm going to go into Vicki's though because it ties in. I can take up the same board for this. So Vicki, your question was, there's a couple of blessings and revelation and you want to know well, what, what are they about and why they appear where they appear. I think it makes sense to flow with that thought because of what we're already on this thought. So of all the blessings, this is going to sound weird to me saying this, that happen in Revelation as you pointed out, only one of them pertains to the, to the actual time stamp of the folks during that time. Everything else is a reference to uh, people outside that time frame and uh, either before or after. But only one blessing is referencing directly people within the events happening. And that's the one in Revelation 14, which is the second one. So let's look at the first one, and, and I'm going to look at them as they go. And to your point, they are there, obviously, for reasons. They're not just happen chance. So the first one in Revelation 1-3, so there's, I'm going to put this down here like this. So in Revelation, Revelation 7 blessing. So you have the first one is in chapter 1, verse 3. And he talks about those, blessed is he who, who those who read, ongoing, and hear, ongoing, the words of the prophecy and observe. And so when you look at this, going back to Revelation in chapter 1, verse 3, you can read that. In Revelation 1, verse 3, he says, blessed is, is he who reads and who, those who hear the words of the prophecy and observe, which means to watch, to guard the things which have been written in it for the time is near. So he's talking about these people who watch, who guard. So here, this, this, this blessing, this promise is to anyone who is living before the, tri before the events in tribulation or revelation, during the events in revelation, or after. This is a holistic type of statement. He's just saying, look, man, if you were to, if you were alive back in BC or now, well, this is not BC, it wasn't written to 100 AD. If you were alive post 100 AD when it was written, AD 100 is in there afterwards, whether you're alive from that point to now, it doesn't matter who you are. If you read it on constantly and you hear it constantly, the words of the prophecy, and you watch and guard them in your heart, you're gonna be blessed by that. Why? Because it deals with events that talk about judgment, accountability, recompense, and the incitement to live right, right? How are you not gonna be blessed by that? By always reading it and hearing it. It's gonna always remind you that Jesus is coming, you're gonna get judged. Jesus is coming, you're gonna get judged. That's the thing that woke me up, if you remember, when we went to Calvary Bible Church. That's the message I kept hearing. Jesus is coming, you're gonna get judged. Jesus is coming, you're gonna get judged. I'm like, okay, enough. Like, what do you mean by all that, right? And what they're talking about is that when you keep hearing that, it makes you different about how you approach the things of God. So. Anyway, that's what that first message is about, so it applies. So the application here, it applies to all or any who, oh, I should say, who are benefited by the word. By the way, so I was telling this to my grandson, and I'll say it to you. 
difference between being having God's benefits and God's blessings, they sound like they're the same thing, but they're not. Bless, blessing is the word we use, that God uses the word for happy. Happy is the man, blessed is the man. So blessing is the word for saying happiness, or blessed is saying happy. So when someone says, don't you want me to be happy? Well, that means to be blessed. In order to be blessed, there's a requirement to do something. And when Jesus says, blessed is the man who, blessed is he who, blessed is the one who, there's always an action associated to the blessing, right? The benefit you have because Christ is in you and Christ has saved you and given you a testament relationship. So you have a benefit of Christ and his love and his peace and his power made available in his word. It's a benefit that you have the ability to know and see that. But the blessing is when you actually do something about it, okay? So to experience God's benefits to their fullest, you have to tap into the benefits you actually use them. If you don't use the benefits, you won't be blessed by them. You won't be made happy in the right way unless you use the benefit book. This is God's benefit package, like at work. You know, they go, here's your benefit package. Everybody's in this, everybody's in my earshot has heard about going to work someplace, and there's a benefit package. Is there a blessing of the benefit package if you don't sign up and use benefits? No. It matters zero to you, doesn't it? But don't lie to yourself and go, my work doesn't offer me anything. Y yeah, they do. It's not their fault you didn't take advantage of the 401k and the health care and all that stuff, right? That's on you. You decide what you want, right? So the benefit package is in God's word. And how we are, we're blessed by how we then apply the benefit package to our life. And when you apply it to your life, God's just saying, look, blessed is the one who reads on going and hears the words of the prophecy. If you watch and guard by always reading and hearing and watching and guarding what you're reading, you're blessed by having that benefit be made real to you. That you want, you, you'll, be, you'll be made more and more aware, Jesus is coming, you're gonna get judged. There's an accountability to live in this Christian life. You cannot constantly read, you cannot constantly hear the book of Revelation and have the idea that you're not accountable. You, I don't know how you come away with that. If you can read the bat book constantly and hear it constantly and come away with, I'm not accountable, I don't know what you're talking about. Because he says it, behold, I'm coming quickly, my reward is with me. You know, to give to each one according to his deeds. He tells you constantly in the book about a judgment. He talks about being an overcomer to the churches. I mean, it's not, there's so many scriptures in there talk about accountability, 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 judgment, wrath. So it's like a scary way of waking you up. So that's the first blessing, right? Then the second one is Revelation 14, 13, which is the only one that refers to people in the timeline that are specific to what he's talking about. So in Revelation 14, 13, he said, I heard a voice from, um, oh, excuse me, in the right one, is that right? Is it 14, 13? Yes, 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right from this time, blessed are those oi necroi. That's what it says. Blessed are those oi necroi, those in the Lord, dying. From henceforth, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow after them. Meaning, blessed, the ones in Revelation 14, 13 is, blessed are the oi necroi. Meaning, don't forget, of the 144,000 Sumeticoi, remember, there's other soon, there's a, they came out of a group of Sumeticoi people that were, they, the Sumeticoi people are Sumeticoi because they did not bear fruit of the truth they were given of the sperma seed. And then all of a sudden God turns on the switch and they, start growing like a weed, right? So the reality is that when they start doing this, when they start growing, there's a few of them that God calls out 144,000. They're in similitude to these people. There's a lot of them that die. You go, what? Uh, yeah. There's only a few of them that are protected because they are the ones that excel to the level of God that was ordained them to be just like these people. It isn't like more didn't make the journey. Yes, they did. Only 144,000 made it. There's more that are starting to bear fruit than 144,000. It's just that those are the only ones that God sanctions as being protected by him that'll be on Mount Zion later on. So that's why in the same chapter about Mount Zion, about those 144 Sermeticoi in the first couple of verses opening up, they meet him on Mount Zion. That's why later on in the same chapter he says, but just want you to know, you guys who are student medico, your fellow brothers who didn't make it this far, who actually weren't protected, who did live, they finally did bear some fruit, but then they weren't like you protected, they did die, they're blessed. 
because their labors won't go without, without being, they're not gonna be exalted to the bridal side of it like you are, but they're gonna be remembered for their labor. So he's talking about those who actually died in the second half of tribulation, who are fellow Sumeticoi people who started to bear fruit, but weren't included in the, in the actual uh, 144,000. Because the Oinekroi, the Oinekroi, are the, they, they're, they're unfruitful. They're the unfruitful soon metacoi. But then based on this context, so they begin, they begin to bear fruit. And then they die. Or then they're killed actually. Which means they're beheaded. And so they their their labors. Follow them, he says, meaning their reward. So they, that's who that one is in Revelation 14, 13. And why does he say, that's the only one he says that's specific to the time frame of who's living that situation because they need to know he's talking about those people in that time frame. Now the other blessing, as you mentioned, Sister Vicki, is all comes later on. Oh, by, the, by the way, Revelation 14 onward is all mid-trip. So this point onward, this is all, this, from this point forward, this is all midpoint. So why does God say the blessings? So of all the blessing God saying, he gives six from one. One is unity, because this speaks to any and all people in Christ. Doesn't matter who you are. I don't care if you're in sporos or of spor or sperma, it's irrelevant. If you read ongoingly and you hear ongoingly, you will be blessed by the book of Revelation. And that's why it's the one blessing, apart from the other six, that all are mentioned after the midpoint. After the midpoint events, that's when all the rest of the six are mentioned. Because he's trying to separate again the sixth number of man and man's inheritance from the one unity that we all have in Christ. That doesn't matter who you are in Christ. I don't care if you're a Mikros, enough. Anybody can read ongoingly and hear ongoingly the book of Revelation and be blessed different magnitudes, but yeah, you'll still be blessed. So that's Revelation 14 was the first one he did post midpoint tribulation. That's the blessing. Then he goes to Revelation 16, 15. He said, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. That means stays awake. Gregoron stays awake, alert, and keeps his garment, the outer garment, so he may not walk naked and they should see his shame. This is a parenthetical, even though it's written after the midpoint, and it's written during the wrath of God. So God's wrath is being, is being unfolded here. So God's wrath is, is, is unfolding. He's unfolding, God's wrath is unfolding. And in the middle of all that, God takes a parenthetical break and says, oh, by the way, because of what's happening right now, Blessed is the person. In other words, do you really want to see my ugly side? Do you really want to see, do you really want to be in a position where you could have just done the easiest thing possible? All you had to do was stay awake and alert and keep your outer garment. And you won't have to worry about anything negative happening to you. So he, you're hearing this horrific wrath of God being unveiled, unfolded, and so he takes a parenthetical stop in the action. That's why it's in parents in verse 15. He takes a parenthetical state, statement of fact to say, but don't worry about it. As long as you, you know, keep watch over your garment, you actually keep close watch of this. You stay awake, you stay alert, stay awake to what's true, what's right, meaning us right now. You don't have to worry about this happening to you because people are gonna be thinking, other Jewish people are going through this. Other folks in Christ are going through this. That scares the bejeebies out of me. He's like, but if you stay awake and alert, and you keep your outer garment, you have no problem. What outer garment? That's the righteous act. In other words, you gotta keep on staying awake and alert and keep on bearing forth the fruit of the spirit. Keep on your obedience. There's nothing to worry about. So he puts that assurance out there because he's describing a very horrific scene. It's almost like he's telling a soldier, oh, by the way, you just, been, you just got enlisted. Let me tell you about more, what? Because you're going there right now. What? I don't, my lifespan is like 18 seconds, no thank you. So it's horrific to hear that, right? So he has to get some assurances to know that as long as you do these things, you'll be saved. Really, okay, cool, thanks. So it's bad enough you have to go into a, the, the lion's den of evil, satanic experiences, 
and God's wrath at the same time coming on the earth. He said it's a reassurance to stay, if you stay alert and awake and you keep your garment, which is you guard, you guard your garment, which is your outer garment, which is your good works, All will be okay. He's giving you the answer. People always, people always ask me, what's the equation to make sure I don't have any? Okay, just stay awake and alert. Keep guard of good works. Always question yourself what you're doing and why you're doing it. Stay awake and alert to what's right and wrong, to what's spiritually true in God's word. Continue to look at yourself and how you're acting out your good works. Make sure they're all done with the right reasons in the right way. And you'll be fine. That's all I got to do? Yeah, that's all you got to do. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. So you can get paralyzed by the horrific accountability that people will have from God's wrath and Satan's judgment. It's not fun. It's horrific. But God's giving you an assurance. So then with that being said, uh, then he has another blessing here. I'm not going to be able to get to all of this. It's time's running out on me here. And Revelation 19.9, then he says in another one, 19.9, um, he says, blessed is he, this is talking about the bride, and he, he says to me, right, blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He also said to me, these are the true words of God. Well, this is pretty obvious, right? There it's a blessing of the bride. So there he's giving forth the blessing of the bride is the most most important and highest blessing reward one can get. And why does he say this now? Because it's in light of in light of Armageddon. So again, in light of people being brought to justice so a lot of folks being brought to, to a reckoning, so it's a day of reckoning. So in a day of reckoning, you, you're, you want to be blessed to be part of the bride, which is the, the most important, highest blessing you can get, to be a part of the marriage feast, which is part of the, again, the dipnon. That's the day of reckoning, which is out ahead. So he's talking about not this Armageddon, but out ahead, you got the, the great white throne. Because that's what's leading into chapter uh, 20. So here he goes, so this is about the, the Dipnon marriage feast, which is day eight. So that's what Revelation 19.9 is about. He's just telling you the most blessed, important, highest blessing of the Lord you can get. He's, he's bringing that up in lieu of the fact Armageddon is just being talked about here, and it's not even funny. It's about to happen in the latter part of chapter 19. Then, of course, he throws the Antichrist and, and, and Satan in the lake of fire. And then the next chapter over, he's continuing the thought about what's happening here, and he has the great white throne. This is the, at the end of the day seven. Talking about his judgment in total. So it's an Armageddon followed by a day of reckoning. So what you want to be, he's talking about blessing of the bride. You want to be the betrothed so that you can be the actual, you can be the betrothed bride, but you want to be revealed as the bride. You want to have both. That's why he brings up, he brings this statement up in lieu of Armageddon, which he talks about, and then the next chapter, which is a thousand years apart, because he wants you to know you want to have a precious promise going into day seven, which is the faithful one being betrothed as the bride. So then in day eight, be, be the, revealed as the bride and, and the inheritance in the heavens. So then he goes into the next um, one here, which is Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has the first portion of the resurrection. Well, that's pretty straightforward is that, again, you're happy and blessed as the person who has that first portion. Meaning, again, why is it bring this up here? Because he just got finished putting Satan into the abyss. 
Uh, and, and so he chained them down there for a thousand years. And so he wants you to know, blessed is he who has a portion. So let me see here. spell. So his portion of the protos resurrection and the reason why this person is blessed to have his, his portion is because when you have your portion in the first resurrection, then you're going to obviously, in this case, be an heir of the earth. So that's an heirship of earth, which means you're not any more influenced by Satan's ability to, to come get you. And it says, or you enter heaven. So you're an heir of earth, or you enter into the heavens. And so when he says, Blessed he has the portion. The reason he's saying this in this context is because he said the second death has no authority over you. He tells you why they're blessed. But in the context of why he said it in that passage is because once you have your, once you have your inheritance, Satan can't take it from you. That, that's the whole point. So once you have an inheritance, once inheritance given, 